we're just waiting a few minutes as participants join. Okay, let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this first episode of this year's series, Let's Talk Books at NMU. I'm Lynn Domina, Professor of English here at Northern Michigan University, which is located on the sacred homelands of the Anishinaabe Three Fires Confederacy. Today, I'm welcome, welcoming Chad Allen, author of Earthworks Rising, Mound Building in Native Literature and Arts. This series will continue throughout the academic year on the third Friday of each month at one o'clock Eastern time. My guest in October will be Susan Branson discussing her book, Scientific Americans, Invention, Technology and National Identity. You will notice at the bottom of your screen, the icons for the chat and for the Q&A. Feel free to use the chat to talk with one another. If you want to post a question for Chad, use the Q&A. I'll be monitoring that for our question period at the end of Chad's presentation. If you see a question that interests you, you can give it a thumbs up icon and that will let me know that it's a popular question. This episode will be recorded and posted on YouTube. To access it, you can simply search for Let's Talk Books at NMU or you can email me at english at nmu.edu and I'll forward the link to you. Before we get started, I wanna give a big thanks to Matt Herbig from Audiovisual Services here at NMU, who's helping with the technical end of this series, and to Dr. Rob Lynn, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, who is supporting us financially. Now I'd like to introduce Chad Allen. He currently serves as Professor and Associate Vice Provost for Faculty Advancement at the University of Washington. He teaches courses on American Indian and other indigenous literatures. He is the author of two previous books, Blood Narrative, Indigenous Identity in American Indian and Maori Literary and Activist Texts and Trans-Indigenous Methodologies for Global Narrative Literary Studies. He was editor of the journal Studies in American Indian Literature for five years and has served in many other leadership capacities locally and nationally. So Chad, welcome. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you, Len. I really appreciate being invited here. It's nice to see everybody uh, who are on the webinar and uh, look forward to having time to have a conversation at the end. I'm gonna share my screen and jump right in. Um, so again, thank you um, for coming. I'm excited to be part of this Let's Talk Books at NMU um, series. And I'm um, saying hello to you from Seattle, Washington. We're here on Coast Salish lands um, in the Puget Sound Salish Sea uh, region. Um, what of my intent today is to give you a quick overview of my two previous books that Lynn mentioned, just to give you some context, then talk about um, Earthworks Rising, uh, my new book that came out in March, which I'm really excited to share with you. And then at the end, I want to gesture to sort of where I'm heading with um, further work in this area. So as Lynn mentioned, my first book is called Blood Narrative. And it's kind of what I'm most known for is doing comparative indigenous literary and cultural studies. Um, it came out of my dissertation work um, in the 1990s. And at that point, really no one had done a sort of major sustained study comparing US American Indian and other indigenous literatures and activism. Some other folks had done work in politics and law, a little bit in history, but no one had yet really done a sustained literary study. I compared US American Indian, New Zealand Maori, literatures and activism from the disruptions of World War II through the rise of major activism in the 1960s and 1970s, and what some people call the native literary renaissance of the 1960s and 1970s, sort of into the 1980s. 
And also put that into the context of global indigenous activism, um, particularly in the 1970s. My second book um, was then called Trans-Indigenous Methodologies for Global Native Literary Studies, and sort of built from my interest in my first book to move away from sort of conventional ideas of comparison, where we're expected as the scholar to stand outside our material and sort of give an objective view and a sort of equal view of all the things we're comparing, and moved instead to what I call indigenous juxtapositions and putting different um, indigenous literatures and context, cultures, science systems um, next to each other and sort of seeing what happens. And so I created what I call itineraries for reading across cultures and geographies, across genres and media, across historical periods, and across the indigenous settler binary, and really ask what happens when we center indigenous ways of knowing rather than always coming back to the dominant. So that's where I end up now with my third book. Um, this is Earthworks Rising, which has a very beautiful cover. I'm very happy with uh, University of Minnesota Press for what they did with the cover. It's one of the artists that I write about. Alyssa Hinton did this beautiful image. Um, Mound Building in Native Literature and Arts. And so in some ways it looks like a departure from my previous work that's focused on global comparisons and global juxtapositions, but it does have some continuity in my interest in reading across alphabetic literature other art forms, now including built environments, and also thinking about indigenous technologies. And I consider earthworks part of indigenous technologies. But the project really began with a question. When I moved to Ohio in 1997 to begin my first academic job at Ohio State University, I was suddenly living in an area with mounds everywhere. There are thousands of mounds in Ohio alone, of course, then even more, across the whole Eastern half of the North American continent. And so because I believe in indigenous studies, we should always begin with the local. We ask, how do I bring the local into my classroom? I asked, how could I bring indigenous earthworks into the literary studies classroom? And so I started thinking hard about how I could get students to think about the earthworks themselves, but also to think about representations of earthworks um, by the dominant culture, but particularly by indigenous writers, indigenous artists, artists, indigenous community members, um, indigenous performers, et cetera. So that's where the project came from, was really thinking about how have contemporary native writers, artists, performers, and communities engaged with ancient earthworks themselves, but also with the principles that undergird earthworks preservation, earthworks construction, earthworks stewardship, those enduring earthworks principles. So the book as a whole really is uh, brings together literary and cultural analysis, looking at novels and poems and essays and performances, but also looking at art history and criticism, looking at visual art and installation art um, and built environments alongside the alphabetic uh, literary tradition. In addition, and this is something of a departure from my previous work, I decided for this project it was really important to bring in my personal history of encounters with earthworks, my own visits to earthwork sites as an individual, but most often in community with other researchers and often with some of the native artists and writers that I ended up writing about. So I was also interested in talking about in some detail what collaborative and embodied research looks like. What do indigenous methodologies look like literally on the ground when we're doing this work? So when I talk about earthworks principles, I'm talking about some specific aspects of, like I said, earthworks construction, but also earthworks use um, stewardship and preservation, and then how we understand earthworks. So some of the key principles that the book engages are the principle of layering diverse materials in order to create durable structures, uh, the principle of multiple structural patterns within an individual earthwork, but especially within complexes of earthworks and earthwork cities when earthworks are kind of put together. Um, that also leads to the idea, the principle of multiple simultaneous alignments Earthworks typically align with water, often with rivers, creeks, or streams, but they also align with other features of the natural landscape, like mountains, hills, and ridges. They align with each other. They align with the cosmos and the regular movements of the sun, the moon, the stars. And they often align then with social systems, with story, with economics, with politics, etc. And another important uh, principle that emerged from this work was the mathematical encoding of earthworks. 
understanding mathematics as an abstract language, but a language that um, can encode information into the structures of earthworks. It's particularly true of the geometric earthworks in Ohio, but it's true of other earthwork sites as well, that the mathematics and the geometry is significant and it's a type of language. And then finally, two other big principles, and I learned these uh, really from working with indigenous artists and writers, people like Leanne Howe and Monique Mojica, um, the earthworks are sites of return, that earthworks are places that people came back to. They have cycles, sometimes those are daily, sometimes they're monthly, maybe they're annually, maybe they're different kinds of seasons, but they're places bring people back and return. And that second, earthworks embody stories. That earthworks, part of the encoding of earthworks is that earthworks tell stories. They have things to teach us still. They're still um, readable text if we know how to read them. So all of that required a somewhat elaborate structure for putting together um, the book. And it took me some time to think about how to structure this book. What I came up with is a kind of complex three-part structure. So I decided to arrange the chapters of the book based on types of earthworks. So there are three major parts, one based on effigy mounds, one on platform mounds, and one on burial mounds. Each of these um, sections then is associated with a major earthworks concept. So effigies, uh, which are earthworks that are mounted into the shapes of animals or humans or other figures, um, is associated with the concept of crossing worlds, of the world and the below world, the world of the living, the world of the dead, other worlds. Um, platform mounds, the very large platform mounds that, um, that are sort of truncated pyramids, um, are associated with the concept of networking systems and really pointing out the sort of relationality of earthworks. Um, a lot of archaeology tends to look at earthworks in isolation, but from indigenous perspectives, earthworks are part of big network systems. And then the third section, burials, is associated with the concept of gathering generations. The idea that burials are portals between the living and the dead, and part of cycles that move from the living to the dead back to the living. That these are not simply sites of stasis and death, but they're actually sites of regeneration in the coming generations. And then finally, each section is also associated with a spatial position or set of spatial positions. So effigies and crossing worlds is associated with above and below. Platforms and networking systems are associated with the four cardinal directions. And then burials, gathering generations associated with center. So it's kind of a seven point um, indigenous way of understanding sort of our position in the world. Our self with the center, the four cardinal directions radiating out and then above positions and below positions. So when you look at the table of contents, then you can see that elaborate structure. Um, I begin with an introduction, which is called Indigenous Earthworks Within and Without the White Imaginary. And I wanted to begin there because I thought it was important for readers to have an understanding of what contemporary writers, artists, performers, and communities are responding to the dominant discourse um, around earthworks. And really since the 18th century, not earlier, um, non-native writers, explorers, settlers, et cetera, um, sort of tried to capture earthworks within non-native systems of understanding and non-native epistemologies. And so I give some sense of that in the introduction. One of the sections of the introduction is called citing, citing, citing. And I do a play here on those puns to really think about the way we understand earthworks as position, as perception, and then as quotation. So I thought what I might do is read a little bit from that section of the book, just to give you a sense of how I understand these concepts and how they set up the rest of the book. So, citing, citing, citing. In the contemplation of indigenous earthworks from multiple ground-based and aerial perspectives, the word citing evokes foremost the concept of position where these precise and well-engineered structures stand within North American landscapes, why they occupy particular locations, how they relate to other physical phenomena, and how they both reflect and intersect social, economic, political, and spiritual systems. Earthworks parallel natural ridges and embankments, follow the waterways of rivers and creeks, mirror the regular seasons of the sun and moon, the pattern coordinates of stars and transit. They occupy symbolic positions too, aligning within North, indigenous North American systems of representation, within complexes of ceremony and ritual, within economies of power and exchange. The word citing, however, invites an obvious pun 
the substitution of its familiar homophone sighting, evoking the equally relevant concept of perception. In our contemporary era, it is difficult to actually see indigenous earthworks because they have been obscured in North American landscapes by centuries of erosion, reforestation, and human neglect on the one hand, and on the other, by centuries of violent attack, agricultural cropping, and partial or full removal by European American settlers and their descendants. The very presence of earthworks in North American material and symbolic landscapes has been largely erased within US and Canadian institutions, evacuated from formal systems of education, from civil and environmental engineering, from rural and urban planning, from art, commerce, and politics. For too many North Americans living in the 21st century, indigenous earthworks are either, either completely invisible or if seen an illegible presence, a ghostly sign or a sign of forgotten ghosts. The mounds, their remnants and their traces appear to bear no inscribed meaning. Citing thus evokes the great difficulty for most contemporary viewers to perceive earthworks in terms of the complexity of their interrelated structures, the conceptual power of their designs, the aesthetic beauty of their architectural forms. It has become hard to imagine how the peoples who built these structures applied their detailed observations of natural phenomena to sophisticated planning and design, to techniques for construction, to the organization of necessary labor. All these achievements have been consistently devalued or simply ignored within the Western intellectual traditions that have come to dominate North America. Citing can, of course, provoke an additional substitution. Scholarly readers, especially, may consider citing's less obvious homophone, citing, which evokes related concepts of the contemporary quotation of earthworks for the forms of indigenous knowledge they continue to embody in the designs and patterns of their structures and the contemporary praise of earthworks for the remarkable achievements they represent in indigenous mathematics, engineering, architecture, art, and astronomy. But perhaps more profoundly, citing can also evoke the way the builders, first users, and later caretakers of mounds themselves understood earthworks as forms of citation. Hundreds or thousands of years ago, mounds were purposely located and specifically designed to cite connections to already ancient ancestors, to past locations of dwelling, ceremony, or events of communal significance, to entities within or emanating from the moving cosmos above, to established or evolving understandings of the origins of the community, such as stories of emergence and migration, or of the land itself, such as stories of the earth diver. All three versions of citing apply to the contemplation of indigenous earthworks and earthworks principles that endure in North American landscapes. And all three versions invite viewers to open their eyes, their intellects, and importantly, their imaginations to messages coded in and among structures that are multiply layered and multiply aligned within and across space and within and across time. So from there in the introduction, I go on to sort of set up my own understandings of earthworks given what I've learned from contemporary indigenous writers, artists, performers, and communities. So one of the things I talk about is that earthworks, as I say, reshape the earth to align with waterways, with natural features in the landscape, with the sky world above, with each other. So understanding those multiple alignments is really important. And the image I have here is a computer recreation of the Octagon Earthworks in Newark, Ohio, and celebrating the moonrise. Um, the Octagon Earthworks is a massive lunar calendar that measures and notes the 18.6 year cycle of the moon's northernmost and southernmost rise and set points on the horizon. It's a phenomena that most living humans are not even aware of, but it's encoded into the very structure of this 2000 year old massive earthwork. Um, these massive projects I'm suggesting are really projects of applied science. This is applied in indigenous science that has been staged in multiple forms, a ceremonial complex, social forum, a sports or civic arena, marketplace for objects and ideas, artistic workshops, open air theaters, and we can go on and on. The image here is from a very famous uh, mapping of the 
Ohio uh, earthworks at Newark. You can see the octagon there on the left, but it was part of a whole complex of earthworks in the valley there, including the great circle. There was also a square, which is no longer extant and an ellipse. And the whole valley was aligned to the cosmos in terms of the solstices. And then the individual earthworks were aligned to both solar and especially lunar phenomena. I then want to argue that earthworks are a form of indigenous writing. And I don't mean writing in a narrow sense of alphabetic writing, but I mean writing in an expansive sense of encoding. And we see here the way that earthworks encode knowledge, not simply on the land, but literally through the medium of the land itself. I argue that earthworks are a kind of writing with the land. And here in the image, you see the way that the alignments work at um, the octagon, which is quite extraordinary. And the octagon is a mathematically perfect octagon that encloses 50 acres of land. There's then a walled corridor that connects it to a perfect circle that encloses an additional 20 acres of land. And then there's a not large mound at the end of it. It's a massive complex that encodes all of this knowledge into its structures. And it wasn't until the 1980s that contemporary researchers figured out what it was, but the knowledge was always there and it still functions and it's still available to us. The other part I've been thinking about and I argue in the book about we understand indigenous earthworks as writing, we have to understand then that we need to develop our reading practices in new directions. We need reading practices that are not simply semiotic, like decoding the alphabet or decoding um, certain kinds of symbols, but also embodied. To really understand and see earthworks requires embodied research and visiting sites and having relationships with these structures. This is an aerial view of the great circle in winter where you can really see how perfect um, the circle is. The gateway there opens to the east. It's aligned to the sunrise. It's also though aligned to the octagon. It's exactly six diameters of the circle away from the octagon earthworks. So coming back into the book after following the introduction and setting up these principles, then I move through parts one, two, and three around effigies, platforms, and burials. And then there's also a conclusion called Earthworks Uprising that looks at very contemporary building of new mounds and what I'm now calling sort of post-removal mounds in Oklahoma. So some of the earthworks that I actually talked about in great detail, one of which is the Serpent Mound in Southern Ohio, um, the largest known serpent effigy in the world. It's a stunningly beautiful site. It was reconstructed at the turn of the 20th century and has been protected in a small state park since then. Um, I talk about this in chapters one and two, um, and it shows up again in other parts of the book. It's been a very important site, both for visiting my own research, as well as it's a site that many native writers and artists have engaged in their work. Another effigy that I talk about is what's known as the alligator mound, but looks nothing like an alligator, also in central Ohio. As you can see there in the image on the left, um, while it has been preserved, the alligator today is completely surrounded by non-native civilization. It was actually surrounded by middle-class houses um, in Granville, Ohio. It's actually hard to find and get there. Um, there is some signage. I write about this in the coda to part one. Each of the codas in, in the book are focused on sort of experiences of visiting earthwork sites with other uh, native researchers, writers, and artists. Um, sometimes those visits also erupt into other parts of the book. I talk about the platform sections. I engage platform mounds, um, Mississippian era platform mounds, such as the large earthworks at Cahokia, which is in Southern Illinois. It's an artist rendition of the massive Cahokia site, which had hundreds of mounds um, there outside of what's now St. Louis, Missouri. And on the right, you see a contemporary photo of what's known as Monk's Mound, which is the largest known platform in North America, mile square base, 100 feet high, multiple terraces. It's an incredibly, uh, remarkably engineered um, earthwork that it has survived for a thousand, a thousand years um, in its uh, current state. I also talk about other less known um, platform mounds. These are the mounds at a site called Otstadlan um, in southern Wisconsin, sort of between Madison and Milwaukee. It's thought of as probably one of the northernmost Mississippian sites. These platform mounds were excavated and largely destroyed, but they've been reconstructed um, at the site. Um, so it's a very beautiful site to visit if you visit the small state park there. And I write about this in the coda um, to part two. Um, I was able to make a visit there. Um, and a Anishinaabe writer um, 
Snake, Newton um, gifted me uh, with a poem about the site uh, that she wrote on our visit there. And then in the burial section, I write about a number of burial mounds um, across the Southeast Mississippian world, but also in Ohio. Um, these are two um, burial mounds that are well known in Ohio, the Site Mound and the Jeffers Mound. I talk about both of them. And they're an interesting contrast. On the left, you have the Site Mound, um, which looks pristine and perfect. It's an elliptical burial mound. And on the right, you have the Jeffers Mound, the conical mound um, that's overgrown with trees and weeds. Um, the Site Mound was completely excavated in the 1920s and therefore completely destroyed, emptied of all of its materials, and then reconstructed with contemporary machinery and then planted with a species of grass that's easy to mow and take care of. And so it looks a certain way, but it's really kind of an illusion, right? It's hollow, it's not full of what was meant to be there. Um, the Jeffers Mound looks more intact. It kind of looks like a romantic ruin, but it too was excavated um, but in the 19th century, an amateur excavation, really alluding, that happened um, in, in the mid 19th century. Um, but typical practice, then a shaft was drilled through it and a tunnel was drilled through and they left the, um, the structure of the mound. So it has this sort of romantic feel of it being a remnant, but it's very similar to site in that it's also been sort of had its functions stopped and, and, and removed. So I write about these mounds and then in relation to um, how contemporary writers and artists are re-engaging burial mounds. So some of the works that I, I, I deal with in um, the book, Alison Hedgecoke's um, poetic sequence, Blood Run, which is about the Blood Run earthwork site on the Iowa-South Dakota border. Um, it's been really key to my work. Um, Hedgecoke mathematically encoded this sequence of 66 poems. And she also 64 of the poems are persona poems. So they're in different voices that animate this earthwork site. So she really brings the site to life by having it speak for itself. And she engages multiple forms of alignment through mathematical encoding. Um, is a kind of remarkable achievement. Um, I put her in conversation with the remarkable um, artwork of Alyssa Hinton, uh, who's just for an Osage descent um, based in North Carolina. And she does these amazing photo collages. So this is the image that ended up on the cover of the book. Um, I do an extensive reading of it. And you can see here though, the way that um, Hinton sort of reconceives um, burial mounds as, as sort of seeds and wombs and places of regeneration and new life. Here we can see the earthwork sort of opening of its own accord and revealing not only the sort of glowing bodies of the ancestors in repose, but also this electric blue embryo of the next generation coming. So the earthwork is much more of a seed uh, than a tomb. Um, I engage a work of a number of native novelists. Two main ones are Leanne Howe and Philip Carroll Morgan. Leanne Howe, many of you will know, is a well-known Choctaw. Um, writer and intellectual um, based at the University of Georgia now. Um, her first novel, Shell Shaker, engages earthworks in really interesting ways, particularly the Naniwaya, which the Choctaw considered the mother mound, but in what's now um, Northern Mississippi. Um, but how also more subtly engages seasonal time in this book and really structures the book around a sort of more mound-based understanding of return um, based on the season, seasons and particularly on the autumnal equinox. Philip Carroll Morgan, um, uh, Anno Polici, The Word Masters, a historical novel that was published in 2014. It's set in 1399 during a period of active earthworks building and use. And he really shows us expansive um, interconnected earthworks communities and really a whole world of earthworks building and use. I also look at um, dominant representations that some of these writers and artists are responding to. This is a painting from 1850 by John Egan of an actual excavation that happened in the 1840s in Louisiana. Um, and you can see here the sort of typical way of, of, of dominant culture using this view of sort of opening the mound and revealing its contents. Um, you also see here sort of white oversight of black labor in the revealing of indigenous right, history and the indigenous past and sort of especially in the US South um, that particular sort of racial hierarchy being invoked in images of earthworks and sort of the role of lost, quote unquote, lost indigenous peoples. Um, I also look at some scholarship, um, early scholarship on mound builders, so-called mound builders. This is um, Henry Clyde Shetron's The Mound Builders from 1930, a um, really important book. Um, he was an Ohio-based archeologist and ran the Ohio Historical Society for many years. I put that in conversation with um, 
more contemporary scholarship on the sort of myth of the mound builders and sort of the way that uh, non-native culture created all kinds of mythologies around who had built the mounds or all kinds of strange theories about white giants, Venetians, Egyptians, Chinese, lost tribes of Israel, people from Atlantis, all kinds of theories, right? And so one of the first books to really do that in a big way was Robert Sofa-Burke's The Mound Builders. Um, really interesting um, early account of that. I also look at popular accounts. Um, there is a whole genre of young adult YA mound builder fiction. Who knew? Um, this starts in the 19th century. It's ongoing today. I look at a range of these books from the 20th century into the 21st century. One of my favorite titles is Mog the Mound Builder by Irving Crump, who was the editor of the Boys Life magazine, which is the official magazine of Boy Scouts of America. And he wrote um, several of these novels about Mog, who was a mound builder. Um, as you might imagine, they're, they're um, a little odd from our perspective today, but they're an interesting context for thinking about what contemporary native writers and artists have to respond to. And then I look at other types of uh, more informed popular accounts often written by archaeologists. This is a account of Cahokia by Timothy Pocatat, who's a major archaeologist based at the University of Illinois, who has done a lot of work at Cahokia. He and his students and colleagues have really formed a lot of the dominant consensus on what that site means and, and how it, how it uh, was functioned. And then finally, the last thing I do in the book that maybe is unexpected, but is certainly the most exciting part in some ways, is looking at what I'm calling post-removal mounds or new mounds that have been built after the era of removal um, in Oklahoma. So two that I engage in the book are the Chickasaw Cultural Center's mound. Chickasaw Cultural Center opened in 2010 outside of Sulphur, Oklahoma. And as you can see in the image here, they built a platform mound, what's also known as a Minko mound or ceremonial mound, um, as part of their cultural center. And then more recently, the First Americans Museum, which just opened outside of Oklahoma City in September 2021, almost exactly a year ago, they built a massive sort of geometric earthwork as part of their complex. Um, it's really fascinating and it's a massive site. I was able to visit that site in 2019 when it was still under construction um, before the pandemic. What's interesting when you put these uh, side by side, um, Chickasaw Nation, which is a tribally specific um, cultural center meeting the needs of its own citizens as well as other visitors, is describing their mound as a replica ceremonial mound. And it sort of suggests that it's a way of accessing the indigenous past. And they put their mound in relationship to a reconstructed village of what it would have looked like pre-removal back in the southeastern homelands. In contrast, the First Americans Museum has built what looks like a very futuristic mound. They call it a promontory mound because it rises to 90 feet around this curving um, embankment. And it really suggests a way of imagining indigenous futures. Um, I've been kind of calling this a kind of cyborg mound because the buildings are integrated into the earthwork. So you have the living mound and the high-tech building all coming together and you see these series of concentric circles and kind of spiraling figure um, of the new mound and complex at the First Americans Museum. So I look at the Chickasaw Cultural Center, here's their uh, nice logo that shows the interconnection of the spiral, the symbol of the eye of the creator and the sun and how they're linked. Um, and here's a map of, of the Chickasaw Cultural Center. It's a little hard to see in this image, but the earthwork is on the left and you can see just its relationship to this larger complex. You have the large parking lot, you come in, there's several buildings, high-tech theater, amazing um, cultural and historical displays. There's an archive, there's meeting space, there's indoor performance space, outdoor performance space, a cafe. And then there's this recreated um, village, uh, the Chakasha and Choka or traditional village. And you can view it either from a viewing platform where you're three stories up and you're looking down into the site, like you're looking down into a diorama, or you can walk down into the site and sort of disrupt that colonial view and now actually be in among the structures and the earthwork, the gardens, the stickball court. Here's a close up of the, of the map. You can see where the mound is in relation to the stickball field, the stomp dance grounds. There's that viewing tower and then the other buildings. Um, what you can't see as well here, but then past the mound, there's also water. Um, they built this site so it's abuts a against a rock creek. So similar to a traditional village, it is near um, running water. 
Here's another view. You can see the other structures. There's a large council house. There are examples of summer and winter houses. There's the bridge across um, the creek. You can see the palisade. You can see the brush arbors here next to the stickball court, and then the edge of the earthwork, which then you can circumvent and walk all the way around and have the experience of being in the presence of um, an earthwork and its relationship to other structures. Um, here's a view from the viewing um, platform looking down across. And here's an, a stomp dance being performed um, for visitors who are sitting under the shade of the brush arbors. So you can really see the way this sort of interaction of earthworks and community, right? And that's happening at the Chickasaw Cultural Center. In the chapter three, where I'm looking at platform mounds, I write specifically about the signage that they use at the Chickasaw Cultural Center and how it evokes a really what I call a living earthworks vocabulary. One of the things that's so surprising, I think, to many non-native viewers and to just many non-native citizens of the United States is that earthworks vocabularies are still in existence and they're still active. People still have words and language for describing the earthworks and their functions. And in the Chickasaw language, it's closely related to Choctaw. Two of those words are Yampochaha and Onchaba. And what I do in the book is I sort of talk about the way that the signage outside um, that's next to the mound and the signage that's inside in the exhibit space use different language and that language is having a conversation with each other. Sort of this back and forth or call and response across different eras of understanding and use of indigenous earthworks, including our own contemporary era. Contrast that then with looking at the new mound at the First Americans Museum. Again, this, this arrow view, you can see that kind of cyborg state. This is when it was still under construction, but the interlocking circles and then the um, curving embankment coming out of and really from the veranda of the large exhibit space. What's interesting when you think about the way, and here's an aerial view on the left, a really overhead view, you can see the geometry of the new mound. What it's doing really is drawing on multiple earthworks traditions. So Oklahoma has 39 federally recognized tribes. People were removed to Oklahoma, what is now Oklahoma from many different places. Um, and this new First Americans Museum is meant to celebrate all of those cultures and all of their histories. And so it brings together multiple mound building traditions. So you can see the way it's drawing on the geometric earthworks from Ohio. That's an image of the great circle we saw before. And also though of platform mounds. So see here the image of Oxlan, platform mounds which were meant to be um, walked upon, right? And used to give a different perspective. Um, the new promontory mound at First Americans Museum is also meant to be walked upon. So you walk up to the 90 foot promontory and have a view of the river and the city beyond. Um, but that's not the only thing that they're drawing on in this sort of putting together buildings and earthworks. They're drawing on very old traditions of having other types of structures near and sometimes on top of earthworks. Here you're seeing artist rendition of Cahokia and Monk's Mound and the use of other types of structures. Um, you can see the way that the pitched roofs actually continue the pyramid structure. And so it's an extension, right, of the earthwork. And they're fully integrated the way that structures um, work together. This aerial view of the, of the First Americans Museum, you can really see its relationship to the river and then to the highways. So part of the way that multiple alignments work, it's a really good example of that. So the river highway, one way of access is right there and the mound opens to the river. But those highways are the intersection of I-35 and I-40. So I-35, Interstate 35 is the big north and south um, artery that runs from Canada to Mexico. And I-40 is our big east-west artery that runs from California to North Carolina. So they position the earthwork at a major crossroads. This is the place of travel and coming together. Um, and it makes sense that this is the place where the earthwork has been put. In addition to these sort of alignments, there are also alignments to the sky world. If you'll notice, you can see in the embankment that there's a tunnel that's been placed through the embankment wall. That tunnel is aligned to the winter solstice. So on December 21st of every year, at sunset, the last light of the sun shoots through that tunnel and on the winter solstice. It's like remarkable, right? It's a cosmological clock happening. And then on January, excuse me, June 21st, at the summer solstice, the ball of the sun sets precisely over the promontory. And so those two spaces, right, measure um, those major movements of the sun. And that is part of then of the daily cycle. And then you have this larger seasonal cycle um, that happens as part of the multiple alignments um, at the site. 
now that the um, First American Museum is open, I've been able to visit. So since the, the book came out, um, they have a room uh, at the um, museum called Of the Earth, Creating First Americans Museum that sort of gives some of this history and shows some of the ways that um, they conceived of the earthwork in relation to the other structures. Um, they have great signage that shows this sort of cosmological alignment, sort of the cardinal alignments to the cardinal directions and to sunrise, um, as well as to the solstices. And they also have this amazing scale model, um, looks like a table, it's round, so you can stand above it and look, and they've created um, a scale model of the site. What's interesting about this uh, model is that it's not static, it's an active model. There's a projector in the ceiling that projects images onto the, the scale model, so you can see the orientation to the cardinal directions, but also the projector projects moving images, and you can see the movements of the sun. So here you see on the left sunrise, uh, the sun is in the east at the site, and then on the left uh, sunset is in the west. Um, I have a recording, I'm going to show you just a minute of this so you can see it in action. So they project a lot of images here, and they have images of the ground blessing and ground breaking ceremonies to build the site. They show some of the pain evidence that were done there, projected onto it. Then they show the movement of the actual sun, of course, to cross the zone. Sorry, I got to So it's remarkable that you don't have to necessarily stand outside for the entire day to see how the site works. You can get this image how it works. Um, and so there's more images here than of uh, the building construction. There are also some other um, quotations and information about the earthwork, um, all the tribes that are in Oklahoma today, all get listed around at various points um, of this cycle. So I'm going to stop there. It's a really interesting. So what I wanted to end with then is that my new work, um, now that the book is out, and now that places like the First American Museum have opened, is I'm thinking more and more about these post-removal mounds and sort of how contemporary indigenous nations and communities in Oklahoma and perhaps at other places as well are re-engaging earthworks traditions at the level of building large structures. Um, Chickasaw Cultural Center and the First American Museums are the two examples I talk about in the book, but there are other examples as well. As well. Some of you may be familiar with what's known as the Mound Building at the Muscogee Creek Nation headquarters in Okmulgee, Oklahoma. This was built in the 1970s um, to look like a mound and to sort of be a partial earthwork, and then has been renovated since and sort of updated. But what's interesting about this uh, building is that it's modeled specifically on the Okmulgee Earth Lodge, or what's known as the Okmulgee Earth Lodge in Georgia, uh, which is one of the few earthworks in that area that are built like this that have an internal chamber as a gathering space inside the earthwork. And so the Creek Nation um, modeled their council house and their Supreme Court uh, meets there as well um, on this model. So it'd be interesting to think about more how that works and to think about contemporary and future oriented um, architecture and urban planning and how it can incorporate earthworks into specifically indigenous designs. And then the Choctaw have built a new cultural center in Durant, Oklahoma that just opened this last year in 2021. And as part of their cultural center, similar to the Chickasaw Nation, they've also built a replica, what they're calling a replica mound. But here, and rather than a replica of a generic ceremonial or platform mound, they built a replica of a specific mound. They built a replica of the Naniwaya, which is really interesting. So here, side-by-side -side photos, there's the Naniwaya in Mississippi, the more contemporary photo, and then the, the new mound that's been built in Durant, Oklahoma by the Choctaw Nation. These I think are really exciting developments. And one of the things I think we're gonna be able to talk about in the future is what is the effects on contemporary indigenous people of living again in the presence of, among and with, and in relation to earthworks? How does it affect the way we do other things? How does it affect the way we produce our literature and art? How does it uh, affect the way we do our commerce and politics? How does it affect the way we engage our social systems? I think it's going to be really exciting to look at this in tribally specific ways, say among the Creek, among the Choctaw, among the Chickasaw, but also in intertribal ways, right? And thinking about places like the First Americans Museum, what will be the effect of um, Native nations, Native individuals visiting that site, but also other folks, um, all kinds of tourists will be visiting that site over the next years. It's going to be interesting to see 
what new developments um, come out of that. So I'm going to end there um, again with Earthworks Rising, and I'm really happy to take any questions or have some discussion um, around the book and other possibilities. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chad. This was really interesting um, from multiple perspectives. So we do have a couple questions in the Q&A. If anybody listening in would like to add any more, um, feel free to do that. So uh, Karen Poremsky says, not a question, but just wanted to say how excited I am to see this work emerge and thinking back to meeting you in Newark years ago. Um, and then Amy Hamilton here at NMU says, uh, hi, Chad. What a treat to see you in this NMU space, almost like you're visiting Marquette. So maybe we can actually uh, make that happen sometime. Uh, she says, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the collaborative elements process of this text, both in terms of artists and writers and perhaps the land itself. I wonder, for instance, how visiting the sites might have been a kind of collaboration with the land. Great. Well, thank you both. First, hi, Karen, and hi, Amy. It's nice to see you on here. I appreciate you coming. Amy, that's a great question. And so I didn't know how to present all of this in this uh, short format today, but it's really important to the book um, in discussing what embodied research looks like and what collaborative research looks like, particularly for Indigenous studies projects. Um, so I was really privileged to be able to work with um, Leanne Howe, um, the Choctaw writer, um, Monique Mojica, who's a Gunan Rappahannock um, actress and playwright. Many of you will know her work. Um, I worked a little bit with Alyssa Hinton, um, less so at sites, but um, we'd become friends through this process, um, you know, writing about her work and then showing her that work and having some conversation back and forth. Um, Alison Hedgecoke, I've worked with, um, Phil Morgan has become a really important friend and mentor in this work and other uh, sort of writers and artists. And so that collaboration was really interesting in different ways. Part of it was going to sites with particular people who were more knowledgeable than I am about how to approach sites appropriately from indigenous perspectives and with indigenous ways of knowing. So Monique Mejica and um, Leanne Howe, as I acknowledged throughout the book, were my major guides and teachers. And it's really privileged to have the opportunity to take them to sites, along with some other Native colleagues at Ohio State um, in Ohio, and did this more than once. Uh, we had, though, a quite remarkable week with them um, a number of years ago, took them to various sites. And Monique and Leanne were able to lead us through sort of appropriate um, protocol for approaching earthworks in a respectful way. Um, and also learning how to be open to the stories and energy um, that's in earthwork sites. Um, I write about, in the coda to part three, I write about a really remarkable encounter that happened at one of the sites in Ohio. It was, uh, it's known as the Holder Wright Earthworks, since been renamed um, um, and become a little small state park. But at the time when we went and visited, it had just come back into the public domain. It had been part of a farm since the 19th century <clears throat> and had, um, there were a number of earthworks there, including some burial mounds, as well as some geometric enclosures. And they had been repeatedly farmed. Some of them had been damaged in the building of a house and silo and other you know, farming outbuildings, but they were still there. The traces were still there. And we had a, um, Parks Ranger, who has uh, was in sort of in charge of the site now, it had been deeded to the city of Dublin, Ohio, um, when the family had decided to stop farming. He took us there and gave us a kind of formal walk around the site, and he was telling us all the official sort of understandings of the site. And when he finished, he allowed um, Monique and Leanne to sort of do their own research, which they talk about as embodied research and sort of um, embodied improvisation at sites as they sort of have experiences with the energy, the stories, the songs that are still in the site. And they had a very strong experience of feeling a female presence at, uh, there is a square enclosure and a burial mound. And um, a song came to them out of the site and they recorded themselves singing the song. Um, and all this happened in front of the park ranger. And so I'm there standing, talking to the park ranger, trying to sort of keep him occupied and stuff while this is happening and I'm taking pictures of it, they're recording themselves. But what's fascinating about that moment is that the park ranger wouldn't stop talking. And he literally talked louder and louder in my ear. So I'm literally looking at the two native women who have 
crouched on the ground and singing into their smartphone the song that has come out of the earth and is riding the wind. And I've got this male park ranger, a white park ranger standing next to me telling me his version of things. And he gets louder and louder. It's clearly made very uncomfortable by what's happening, but rather than really say something directly or he just keeps talking. And so it was this weird embodied experience. And I realized later that my experience there was very much the experience of the earthworks themselves. That I was caught between competing discourses and competing performances. On the one hand, the sort of gendered indigenous performance of sort of reclamation and um, acknowledgement. And over here, this sort of white male patriarchal um, dominant narrative that's trying to sort of overwhelm that. And it was really interesting to be so embodied in that and thinking like, well, this is what's happened all the time. It's not unique to me. And that the, the earthworks are always right now sort of caught between, right? Indigenous individuals and communities and nations coming back and reclaiming and acknowledging and dominant discourses, right? That put this authoritative monologue um, on top of them. So that part of the embodiment was really powerful. And I think you're right that it was in many ways a collaboration with the sites themselves and the energies and sort of forces um, that remain in, the, in those sites when they're still active. So thank you for that question. I hope that is that gets that something of the answer. Yeah, what an experience. Yeah. Yeah, so then we, we have several more questions here. Okay. Uh, Chris Pexa asked, uh, says, thank you so much for your talk. I was intrigued by your sense that burial mounds specifically may, quote, gather generations together. I'm wondering if you could say more about how you view this kind of movement across times and how is it the same as or different from being just a memorial or place of memory, like, say, a cemetery? Oh, well, that's a great question. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. Um, so I really learned this idea from people like Allison Hedgecoke and Alyssa Hinton, as well as Chris Leanne Howe and Mahika and others. Um, but as you see in the image on the cover of the book and in other um, work by Alyssa Hinton, this idea that the earthworks are not dead objects or just sites of the dead, but that they're agentive, right, and lively, and that they're really portals that link what in Southeastern traditions are the three worlds, right? The upper world, the surface world that we live on, and then the below world or lower world. And also link the living and the dead in the sense that the earthworks are kind of seeds or wombs um, and that the, they're part of the cycle, right? Um, it's interesting too, and I write about this in the book that in some native languages, like in the Muscogee language, um, early um, anthropologists have working with the Muscogee sort of we're intrigued and in recording that one of their words for earthworks is the word for navel, right? Um, this idea that it's the um, umbilicus, it's the connection, right? It's where it's like the, the center, like the, the maternal body, right? The umbilicus is also what the earthwork is function. Um, in Chickasaw language, one of the words that a uh, yampo chaha means tall clay pot. And it may be as likely a reference to um, interring bodies um, in clay pots and then putting them in earthworks. So um, bodies were often put out for bone picking first. And then when the bones were clean, they were gathered and put into clay urns. The clay urns are placed into the earthwork. Um, but then if you think we put those concepts together, right? It's the, both the place of rest and death, and then it's the next cycle of regeneration and the coming of the next generation. So in that sense, you know, it functions sort of like what uh, philosopher of religion, Machia Eliada, would call like an axis mundi, right? This sort of cosmic tree or cosmic axis, a hollow tube that joins, right? Different planes or different aspects. And so I think we can think of that as crossing time. We can also think of that as crossing generations, right? And then you see that very, very much in Alyssa Hinton's work. Alison Hedgecoke also builds this into her sequence of poems, Blood Run. The burial mounds have their own voice and the burial mounds describe themselves as you know, hollowed wombs and um, the sort of seeds and, and uh, sort of protection, right, for the next generations and coming. And this idea too that um, earthworks are sort of dormant but not dead, right, that, that the materials may be waiting for the appropriate time um, to move forward, but they're not dead and static in the way that they are often portrayed in dominant discourses. So I think that is the way that they're quite different than, say, a conventional. Western cemetery with this idea of um, it's just a place of memory. 
um, I think the earthworks are seen at least in, in this uh, particular views by these artists and writers um, as places of regeneration and resurgence. And so it's interesting to think about then what, what, what would reactivation really look like? Can we reactivate earthworks principles at contemporary sites? So for me, that's one of the reasons it's so exciting to see the new earthworks being built um, in Oklahoma and to think about that. Thus far, I'm not aware of people building new burial mounds. Um, and that of course would raise a lot of ethical issues, I think for some people. Um, so it's interesting to see people starting with platform mounds and then some geometric mounds. So I hope that, that gets at your question. Um, Karen uh, also says, uh, one of the things I love about the mounds is that they are built by hand, people carrying baskets of dirt, placing them, heading them to compact the soil. I imagine that there's a sense of community belongingness from such an endeavor. Can you talk about how or whether this shows up in alphabetic literary works? Yeah, that's interesting to think about. Thank you, Karen. Um, the thing I would say about that is that they are built by hand. Um, what's interesting when we think about the process of layering and layering materials and the principle of layering materials, it's not only rocks, clays, and topsoils that are brought together, it's also discourse. And so part of the sort of human um, endeavor of building an earthwork, yes, there's the physical labor, but there's also this kind of discursive labor. And what we pretty sure happened, and we're really certain of what contemporary engagements with earthworks involve as well, is the layering of discourse as well as the layering of materials. So chant, song, oratory, but also dance. Um, you think about sort of dancing the site before you would build on it, right? And literally pressing energy into um, the soil that's going to be used to create a site, right? Speaking or chanting, uh, certain types of ceremony over a site, singing songs at a site um, before they're built, as they're being built, when they're being used. And so this idea that um, earthworks would also accrue discourse, right? And would accrue power over time, right? Psychological power, emotional power, and spiritual power um, over time because of human involvement. So I like to think of really earthworks as they, they do record that human involvement, right? Sort of traces of how they were built, but also traces of how they were used, particularly how they were used maybe ceremonially um, because of that discourse, right? Being placed in there. So I think we see that in some of the literary works as well. And I would say again, Hedgecoke, the way she layers voices across that text is I think part of her trying to show that the earthworks themselves speak. Right, so that the mounds speak for themselves and not spoken for in that, in that uh, sequence of poems. But other aspects of the site also speak. And that's also important in a sense of not the earthworks in isolation, but as part of this larger network. So river has a voice, the sun and the moon have a voice, various plants and animals have voices as well as the earthworks themselves. And then skeletons of uh, people buried in the sites, um, ghosts of people have been removed from the sites, ghosts that still linger. Um, all of that is, is, is captured in sort of Hedgecoke's vision of what an uh, earthwork site might look like. And uh, Chris asks, uh, I'm asking this in part because where I live in St. Paul, Minnesota, a mound site, Indian Mounds Park on the bluffs overlooking uh, the Mississippi River has been re-signed by the city as a cemetery. So oh, interesting. referring back to um, his earlier question. And yeah. then we have um, one more uh, question, Kimberly Gale Weezer, I think. Uh, Hi, Chad. I thought you might want to know that my husband Rance, and I'm not going to try to pronounce his um, surname, was a member of F FAM's creative team. Among other work, he designed the Chunky Gang with ind indigenous futurisms in mind in his design. Um, Hi, Kim. Thank you for that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I love the... Uh, the Chunky Game. So for those of you who haven't visited the First American Museum, there are a number of interactive um, places using contemporary technology and sort of the immersive technology. Um, one of them is, is a Chunky Game. So that so Chunky was a game, that's an old historical game in the Americas and was played at places like Cahokia. And so there's images of Cahokia and you get to be the player. So you get to sort of stand there and in, in, interact with the technology and uh, try to throw the spear at the chunky ball, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, I think, particularly for kids, but actually kids of all ages, I think it's really fun. Yeah. 
And what I love about it, and I think what's so impressive about the First Americans Museum, and it's true of the Chickasaw Cultural Center as well, and I haven't had a chance yet to visit the, Choc the new Choctaw Cultural Center, but I, from the images I've seen, it also looks the same, is that all of these new cultural centers and sites that are incorporating mounds are designed to be fully immersive. This is not colonial era museums where you have very static dioramas and things behind glass cases and just the kind of static images of the dead past. Instead, there's all of this way, all of these ways to immerse yourself into living indigenous cultures. And as Kim makes clear in her question, this idea with indigenous futures, futurisms in mind. And I see that very much that the First Americans Museums, its incorporation of an earthwork, which is a very old technology into its building is very much about the future. And actually, it's nice of you to set me up this way, Kim. Um, I end the book at the very end of the um, conclusion by making that argument that what I think the First American Museum, Museum teaches us that is true of earthworks generally, that they were always oriented to the future, that this is always the intention. And that's why when Leanne Howe says that earthworks are sites of return, she means that that's because their expectation is that people will come back to these sites and people will come back to these technologies and they'll be renewed, right? They'll be renewed within indigenous communities. And that's what makes them so powerful. Well, thank you, Chad. This has been great. Uh, it's been really interesting. Um, and thank you everyone who's uh, posted a question or joined in, um, listened and to all the people who will be watching the recording. So um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and your weekend, and I look forward to running into you at some academic uh, venue or another. All right, so we can sign off. Great, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye.